know, we can all go get beers after. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, everybody? Corey Singletary with the Citizens Utility Board. And as always, I'm here with Tom Content, Citizens Utility Board. Tom, our executive director, and we are here at the Midwest Renewable Energy Association Energy Fair 2022. Welcome, guys. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for and having we us. Have, and our, our special guest today is Nick Hyla. Nick, can you tell folks a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm the executive director here at Midwest Renewable Energy Association. We're a nonprofit in uh, central, based in Wisconsin. We're here in central Wisconsin, our main campus. We do this event every year. Haven't for the last two years, but we're back. And uh, we do it's a lot great of- great to be back in person. Yeah, yeah, we'll interject. It's great seeing you guys in person. Um, and we do a lot of education work, uh, a lot of training. We manage training partnerships. Uh, and we are we just really do training and education to advance clean energy adoption in the state of Wisconsin and surrounding states. Cool. And the, the fair has been going for how long? I, I'm this is our 31st fair. We started in 1990 uh, and we missed two years because uh, I guess people didn't like to see other people during the pandemic, which is probably- People good. didn't want to meet in person no, for some reason? No, they didn't want to meet in person. Even outdoors, it's probably a good idea. And this, is, this would be a hard event to do over Zoom. Uh, it do, it sure would because um, it's 11,000 people over the weekend and they like to come and uh, see each other in person and network, shake hands. That's great. I would, I'm would. i just curious, what do you see as the big, some of the big themes uh, for MREA and, and for this year's topics from this year's fair? Um, so one, far? Of the, one of the growing uh, themes has been uh, electrification and probably leading with electric vehicles. I think there's just a ton of interest in electric vehicles and we have uh so we were uh the first or one of the first uh places to install a fast charger a dc fast charger for electric vehicles and we have a fleet of level two chargers set up today 14 different chargers and so we have a clean energy car show and that has been growing and growing and growing and so you know i was just uh, before i walked in here to talk with you guys uh, just walking through and there's just hundreds and hundreds of people lined up with electric vehicles and talking to customers. And it's um, so I think that uh, vehicle uh, electrification uh, is a big topic and energy storage. And uh, we also have been doing tours every day. We have an energy storage demonstration center. We have kind of like all the latest and greatest in home and commercial energy storage. And that's been a big topic for everybody, energy storage. Yeah, more and more folks, um, when they're if they're adding solar, they're they're moving on to add the battery. I remember Focus had 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 said that in 2021 uh, there saw a, a big jump in folks that were not just getting solar, taking getting the solar incentive, but they were layering on the battery. Yeah, I think there's probably three factors at work. Um, one is we're just seeing these kind of intense windstorms, and not that there's uh, many extended power outages. I think the utilities do a great job of keeping the power on, but you know, I think that as people are more and more concerned and we see more and more outages, you know, you're seeing kind of like people with critical loads, like their freezers and whatever that are more and more interested. Um, I also think that just kind of like the, you know, the zeitgeist and the technology adoption and, uh, you know, lots of people that like lead with the Tesla power wall and then they, then they become curious about other storage. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think the third one, cause this is kind of a, as you guys know, uh, this is kind of an energy geek event is that, you know, as we look to the future of the electric grid, uh, when you, when you begin to model that out, um, what becomes really important for like an affordable, uh, and consumer friendly grid is demand management in the distribution system and the ability of customers to engage in that. And so a lot of these new storage technologies, so if you're on a dual rate metering where you're paying high off peak prices, they will just sit there and make sure that you're using electricity most affordably and that helps even out demand on the grid. Um, and so I think there's just a lot of interest in what is this new kind of uh, customer centric model? How can the customers be part of you know helping us save on electricity costs in the future. Yeah, and that's a theme that I hit on on our uh, one of our talks on the utility bill clinic talk we had. Just it's 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 important about saving energy overall, but emerging is as a as very significant as when the energy is being used. Yeah, because the total system cost can be 
can see a lot of savings mm -hmm. if you can pare down those peaks on those hot summer days. Yeah, I mean, as we all know, the, the grid really has one operating parameter, which is supply must equal demand or failures occur. And part of meeting like that balance is being able to control demand. And, um, and that saves us all money because it keeps uh, utilities from building stuff that they have to charge us with plus interest in the future. And, um, and so that's, an, that's been very active conversation here, all the policies around there, the technologies. And frankly, there's just, you know, there's the geeky factor. So we have like a span uh, smart breaker in our storage room. So there's a tour going on right now. So uh, our uh, uh, resident storage expert, Nick Mathis, will basically use his iPad to like shut all the lights off <laughs> on the smart breaker. And people, you know, and you can manage all of your loads in real time uh, from the breaker in the breaker panel on your smartphone. So I think there's just a lot of kind of like interest in some of the some of these new technologies it's really a g whiz factor I'm yeah there is stuff, there right? sure is yeah well and and i i've been to mre affairs going back to even when i was back working for the commission and that's always something that i found really interesting is is because you, you mentioned it's sort of a, like an energy geek event yeah and that you can kind of see some of these uh commercial products um you know when they're in infancy is not the right word, but before they become more mainstream and you can go out and talk to people who are dealing with, you know, more advanced load control devices or newer storage products yeah. and all those types of things. Uh, and also, but also some stuff that, you know, Tom uh, talked to folks here today too, is like, you know, before you go and invest tens of thousands of dollars in, in solar and storage is make certain that your efficiency is yes. up to snuff, yeah. your building envelope is solid. And we're mm -hmm. actually... Um, our, our table is right next to some folks that have some in very interesting um, passive home sort of construction yeah. techniques mm -hmm. and sort of, sort of the modular pre-built stuff. And so it's, it's a, it actually is really cool in terms of just if you're interested in um, the, the types of technologies and, and services and, and just information to help you better control sort of your own personal energy future. It, it's It's been in my experience, always been a really great event. Yeah, you know, the, the interesting thing, what has brought me and kept me at the MREA and at the Energy Fair is there's this graciousness. Like the, we put out, we, you know, uh, have a committee that accepts presentations, but there'll be 250 plus workshops, 50 minute workshops that happen all week long. And there's so many people that are sharing their stories and the, their experiences. Some of them are associated with businesses. Some are like you, you all do a utility bill clinic. And uh, those workshop tents are packed. They're packed. They're like standing room only uh, for like your utility bill clinic or uh, energy efficiency in your house or, you know, and, um, and so it's been a real blessing for us to have so many people in Wisconsin and surrounding states that really are interested in helping people kind of uh, meet their energy goals and kind of, um, you know, do the things that you're saying, like deep energy retrofits and solar adoption. So it's a great network of people here. Yeah, and I wanted to just touch base. One of the programs that uh, we talk about ways to save, right? But one of the ways that through solar that people can save and get extra savings is through the group buy. Yeah, you've had those for a number of years now, and they, it seems like they 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 started small and they've kind of mushroomed around yeah. the state. Yeah. So you know, one of the things that we have always really been concerned about is, you know, when it comes to uh, technology like solar. Um, you know, one thing you have to think about is, you know, pe the first people who bought solar weren't buying it for the economics. And that's a good thing, but it also means that they have, there may be a disposition where they're kind of a target audience for scams, you know, and because they are, uh, some of this is driven by the heart. And what we know is um, solar, most solar is like sold by referral. It's happy customers make more solo customers. And so there really is an education. That's kind of why the MREA started is to make sure that that if you are going to get a solar electric system or an energy storage system, or you're going to get your home uh, air sealed, or you're going to buy an electric vehicle, that you get what you're paying for, that you fully understand and eyes wide open into, into, this, into this deal. And so we started these solar group purchase programs because what we want to help people do is right size their expectations. And what we say is, hey, if after our workshops, we call them solar power hours, after the solar power hours, if solar is doesn't seem right for you, don't do it. Come back next year or, you know, keep and, you know, always get multiple bids. But if it is right for you, what the group I does is through competitive contractor solicitation um, and through bulk purchasing of solar in a certain area, it lowers the price. 
And so uh, we've done over 17 megawatts of solar on uh, approaching 2,000 um, homes and businesses through these group purchase programs. And a lot of it is about the customer education and helping them understand their utility bill and how solar works over time and how to read a proposal and how to know what's good equipment and how to select a good installer right. and all of that stuff. And, um, and so we're, if we want a market that, um, that grows and that meets the, the expectations that we have of distributed generation, then we have to be out there helping people make sure that they're getting what they're paying for and that the, these systems are performing the, the way they're supposed to. Yeah, and for, and for us, you know, consumer protection is, is something we don't talk about often because usually like the, the, the dollars and the bills catch the most attention, but it is it is something that we talk with folks very regularly about issues they have with that are related to their utility service in our case. But I think, I think you hit on something that, you know, solar used to be this sort of very niche, sort of wonky people purchasing with their with their heart or with mm -hmm. they had other motivations. But if it if it's gonna become sort of a more of an off the shelf mainstream product, um, you know, there have to be resources in place to help people navigate the fact that it's not something that people ever really learn about. Yeah. You know, uh, it's hard enough for get to get people to really get to understand how their utility service works, which is normally just you plug something in and turn a light switch on. <laughs> magic. Right. It's, and, and the magic is hard to get people yeah. to understand. And you're talking about, you know, putting in a device on a rooftop and maybe something in a in a in a in a storage um my understanding is you have to have a special room for battery electric storage, but you know, all this new technology that they've never heard about, but is now sort of like mainstream. And how do you do that without getting taken advantage of? Yeah, I mean, and here's just a, a, an example. So in Wisconsin, so we sit in a line energy territory and they have net energy billing where on a monthly basis, they, so if you, they will allow you to offset your electric use up to your consumption. So if you think about that from a solar customer standpoint, that means if I use, say I use 500 kilowatt hours in a month and my solar electric system produces 500 kilowatt hours, then all of the value, all of the cost savings, the monetization of that investment comes from reducing my expenses by like 12 and a half, 12 cents a kilowatt hour. However, when you produce more in any month than you use, all of a sudden they credit you at wholesale, which is like three or two and a half cents. And so for a customer that's like, I just want to fill my use or I don't want to have to purchase electricity from, from the utility, it's important for, for them to understand like, well, the utility service is likely really necessary and that your system doesn't work if there's a grid outage because that inverter needs the grid signal to operate and that if you overbuild your system you know it might be satisfy your goals but it might not be the financially right size system so just helping people understand the basic mechanics of how the the systems work and uh is it becomes really important and it helps them understand their utility bill helps them understand what their electric utility is and how they operate and it helps them understand you know their options uh, and, and whether it's right for them or not and as far as the on the consumer protection side one one thing that I'm wondering is how do you are there scam artists out there I think there I've hearing stories of people of solar companies saying oh you're gonna ha never have to pay an electricity bill yeah, again yeah. you know there's a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of claims that are thrown out there and so that's one thing we want to make sure that people are going to you know local reputable uh, uh, contractors if they are going to do it yeah so that's one thing that we do is we do a com so we in our group by programs we set up an advisory committee that's made of the local jurisdiction could be the city county both uw extension local technical college other partners and then we do a request for proposals we get bids and we give that committee the rubric and they weigh those bids and then they select a contractor that ends up being very high visibility for the contractor there's a lot of pressure you know the city's involved the county's involved the local technical college is involved and uh, and we you know we sort through multiple bids um, and you know that oftentimes it's not the cheapest bid that are selected it's like local contractor and quality and warranty and workmanship and products and so that's an educational process that really helps and even but outside of that I think it's really important to get multiple bids right um, and to if it sounds too good to be true it likely is and so if you find yourself in a high pressure sales situation where it's like sign here today because the rebates are going away just pause there's no such thing it's all good <laughs> you got time everybody it, take a step yeah, everybody back, take a step back um, because you're going to get a more photo affordable longer lasting system you know that, that what the what you're really doing when you're buying a solar electric system 
is you're diversifying your investment portfolio, right? You're saying, oh, I'm going to invest over here. And this is a hedge against future electricity price increases here. So as electricity prices go up, this investment's going to return more. That's good. But it has to last that long. You know, it's a system that, I mean, they're modular, scalable, no moving parts warranted, but still it depends on how they're built and it depends on the quality of workmanship. And that's what we want. We want high quality. If we want to realize the dream of all of us participating in managing an electricity system that is more open, more shared, more beneficial, more resilient, then this is a key aspect of what we're doing. We have to train installers and train people to install good solar. We have to have good permitting processes. We have to have good interconnection. We have to have good utility partners. The systems have to work for a long time. So that's really what our, what our focus is. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, and I think that the, the thread in there that I kind of hear relating it back to the stuff that we do a lot of times is, you know, we're thinking about solar, right? And most people look at, at solar, solar installations as, as good and beneficial, but not all solar installations, not all solar systems are, are the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and just because you put solar on it, does it automatically mean something? It's something the customer should sign on, right. the, on the line with the contractor. Um, and that's sort of how we view like the bigger scale issues, like with the utilities is you know we sometimes um you know have 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 more nuanced or or, or uh i don't know uh, more passion-filled conversations with customers when we get involved with um large-scale solar uh applications by the utilities and they're like well, why do you hate solar and it's like well it's not that we hate solar we just need to make certain that the utilities are making the right investment just yeah. like we should be you know we want customers to be having good experiences with their own installations we want to make certain that the utilities are spending the customer's money on the right type I of can't, investments. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that and how much I value the Citizens Utility Board in Wisconsin and Illinois and Minnesota and Michigan because, you know, in the context of utility regulation, you know, one of the big concepts is like cross subsidization. Right. But, you know, the, the, the utility, um, uh, the appointees at the Public Service Commission, the regulators, they're appointed by politicians who are more and more put into position because of lobbying and money and and who doesn't have a representative is all the residential ratepayers out there so there's always this potential pressure to put that extra cost on the residential ratepayer and i appreciate and highly value your ability to be technology agnostic and to really work in, in a very strategic way to make sure that, because everything we build today, we have to pay back plus interest in the future. That increases rates. And if the utilities had their way, they'd build it expensive and they'd capture us so that we can't escape those fees. And so it's important to me that you're looking very critical at these things and, um, and you're, the, you're the group that we depend on to do that, really. Um, and so we, we're with you, you know, I, I, you know, I think for me, my fear and my expectation of you all at the Citizens Utility Board, my fear is that what we're going to do is we're going to support the build out of this new renewables infrastructure led by large scale utility projects that aren't bid in a cost competitive matter, that aren't transparent, that are too expensive, that the utilities get a high rate of interest, and at the same time, we're gonna allow the commission to erode our ability to reduce our electricity bill through on-site solar, uh, to reduce our electric utility bill through efficiency, and that we're gonna be trapped in an overbuilt and expensive grid, and that's gonna hurt our state economically because who wants to move to a state where the, where the electricity rates are high and there's no way to like normalize your costs or reduce your costs. And so I think it's, you know, it's incredibly important as much as we're advocates for renewable energy, you have to, we have to recognize and appreciate your, your role uh, as a citizen utility board and making sure that, that the rules are played by and that we're doing the best we can. Prudent, prudent expenditures and uh, facilitating customer choice. Next time, I'm just going to have you write my comments. <laughs> that's right. that's, that's, that's right. What, what, you, what you just said is, is, is in slightly different, you know, words, you know, the themes that we've been trying to, um, you know, emphasize before the regulator and, and I know Tom talks with folks downtown from time to time as we're going through this, this transition, right, is it's not... Um, you know, let's not end up in a situation where we're trying to put lipstick on a pig and yep. the lipstick is the word solar or battery mm -hmm. electric storage or something yep. like that. And, and it is, and, and for us, we like coming to MREA because as, as sometimes uncomfortable the conversations are with customers, you know, it gives us an opportunity to spend more than just 
um, you know, 10 seconds of Tom being on um, public radio or something like that and having a nuanced conversation about the things you're talking about, about being like, you know, look, we want to make certain that it's a win win for for everybody and that your rights as a customer to kind of choose your own choose your own future on on how you want to meet your utility needs um, is protected. Um, but at the same time, right. if your neighbor doesn't want to, then, you know, we want to make certain that we're not, you know, doling out overly rich payments so that they're so your neighbor's essentially paying for you. And that's a, it's it's a tricky conversation, and uh, you know we, we try to walk that line. It's a balancing act, right? It is, and one of the things I also appreciate that you do. Not that I'm just here to sing your praises. <laughs> that's really not that's not why we brought you. Ch in. Channeling your inner consumer advocate yeah. voice, I love it. <laughs> um, is you know low income ratepayers, right? Um, you know that that's uh, you asked about themes for the fair. And I gave you the kind of like technology themes that right, really draw right, the geeks right. in, but the, the real theme of this fair is, you know, the just energy transition because, you know, the the opportunity here is that if we're going to make a new electricity system and if we're going to take advantage of the technologies and the business models and the kind of education awareness that could, that could power a more distributed system, then we have the opportunity to stop the siphoning of energy profits into a small group of people and spread them more across the state and include places that have been historically dumped upon with our energy waste um, and have, have historically not been, received the benefits of the energy system. And so I think it's really important that we recognize, you know, that level of work that you do when it comes to like uh, disconnections of utility service and like thinking about how low income customers are affected by fixed charge increases or or even, um, you know, which is a growing conversation. Like, what does it look like to electrify? And if we're only leading with the people that can afford it, then what happens to those people that can't? And how do we how do we help everybody kind of? Uh, be able to control their electricity costs over time. And so that is another big uh, uh, conversation at the fair and one that I know you you all work on pretty pretty heavily. Yeah, and it, it, I think it's a little bit about changing the narrative before decision making, right? You mentioned cross subsidies, cross subsidization. And in my, at this point, like 12 years working in the industry, um, that that always is the issue that comes up. But the narrative up to this point is always that it's a cross subsidy that flows from all other customers to say the rooftop solar owner. And certainly if you don't get the rates right, that can happen. But one of the things we've been trying to emphasize to the, to the commission, especially recently is like, it goes the other way too, right? If you don't set the rates right, um, then it's essentially the, the, the generation owner, the solar owner that is providing benefits to the grid for which they're not being fairly compensated for. And the, you talked about equity as well and, you know, low income. And for us, you know, in addition to making certain that folks can afford their rates, you know, we want to make certain there are opportunities for uh, low to moderate income, maybe not individuals specifically, if you are truly low income, but for, for folks that have been at, at this point unable to participate in the clean energy transition, that they have an opportunity yeah. to participate. And things to, in my mind, this is sort of just Corey talking, um, things like community solar, things like uh, third party financing options and, you know, making it so that we're not, you know, dramatically changing anything. We're just sort of tweaking the model a little bit, but those open up um, options for folks who have historically not been able to afford the big upfront capital mm -hmm. to say invest in solar or even, you know, big, big retrofit projects for their home. You know, the, the states that are, that are getting it right, in my opinion, are ones that have integrated resource planning. You know the ability we talk to, about that from time to time yeah the ability to look at to, to have a process that builds intelligence outside of just the black box that is the utility you know if you have a process by which the utility has to provide data you know in god we trust everybody else bring data in front of the public service commission then we can say is there a cross subsidy from a solar owner because the only study i've ever seen proposed in front of the commission was from we energies that said a solar owner is providing value to the grid the, the electrons that come from that solar electric system are more valuable than the retail rate and if you look at what's the modeling that's done in minnesota the same is true they keep looking at that value of solar and solar is just a benefit to other rate payers and it always surprises me that a spokesperson from a utility mostly we energies can go in the paper and just blanketly say that that's happening and never have to come in front of the commission and prove it. And I think that's a challenge in Wisconsin because we don't have that data-driven process through integrated resource planning so that we can say, 
actually, would it be cheaper instead of building, uh, you know, a solar plus storage utility scale or like a peaking gas plant? Would it be cheaper to just invest in demand management in the distribution system? Would it be cheaper to invest in solar plus storage? Because isn't that isn't that the the point of regulation is you have a profit driven private company that makes money on returns and the regulators need to say like, okay, you could make more money that way, but that's going to be more expensive for everybody in the future. And our job as regulators is to provide a semblance of competition and make sure that we're using the best data possible so that future ratepayers don't curse us historically for like trapping them in a system that's too expensive and overbuilt. And so I, you know, I, I, I'm cons I get really concerned about this kind of like tired talking point from the utilities that everybody adopts the solar electric system is, you know, potentially increasing rates on other people because it's just generally never proven to be true and everybody that's ever looked at it is not true. Um, but, you know, to, to say though, I do recognize, however, that the solar adopters, and this is in our data in Wisconsin and national data, are um, upper middle in, middle income, upper middle income, high income people. And the solar adoption rate for lower to moderate income households is very low. Right, enter and, uh, community solar enter, is one of the options. Yeah, right? enter community solar, even you know this kind of like on bill cost recovery through tariff, like pay as you save pay program, as you save, yep. which I think is a really interesting concept to bring in utility partners and and uh, make investments on rooftops and in houses that serve as large scale power plants, but that provide direct benefits to people. Um, so I, I my, my fear is that we're not smart enough, we're not informed enough, and we don't have enough rapport in the public service commission kind of stakeholder group to move ideas forward that could benefit everybody and i think you guys do a really good job of threading that balance you're not here to support everything i want you're not here to support everything the, that the utilities want uh you're there to say what is the most cost effective investment that keeps rates low and that makes this market work for everybody and some key themes that we we do agree on is the need for better planning the need for an, yeah. uh, an integrated resource yeah. planning process that's more effective and as well as that our system today is much too balanced uh, on the supply side versus demand. Yeah, it, it, it definitely tips that way. I, I mean, I'm not I'm not going to lie. You know, wearing the consumer advocate at now, I will absolutely every day thank the pro the march of technology and the decrease in cost curve for things like solar and storage because it makes the conversations we have with customers yeah. so much easier because it's not it's like okay it's all good now it's yeah. all it's it's, 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 it's less expensive 90 percent yeah, yeah, yeah. so i don't have to be the wet blanket in the room being like oh man i would love solar god it's just so expensive yeah. and it wasn't that long ago and i think to your point is we need to be nimble we need to be responsive and we have laws and regulation that have functioned pretty well to this point but it's all the it's like the little things like being able to put for example if a, if a landlord wanted to put solar on the rooftop of a multi-family building that primarily um you know how it was home were homes to low to moderate income customers and to be able to sh and spread that benefit out to every meter in that building i feel like our laws and regulations should allow that i think that you know things like community sol solar pay pay as you save and it gets back to the theme that we have about you know more choices is better than yeah. is, is than 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 fewer um and and that's something that we we keep banging the drum on that and it well, doesn't if the yeah. utilities don't bring uh transparent uh, data-driven process to the table, the default needs to be more consumer choice, yeah. right? Yep. I mean, um, how, why, does, why would the default be less consumer choice, less market transparency, less competition? Why, why would that ever be the default? That, yeah. Like, prove to me that that is a bad, you know, like, prove to me that there's some cost subsidy there. And I think that that's kind of where I, I appreciate your, like, that conversation at the commission. That being said, you know, the utility investors have a very heavy finger on the scale and um, because the business model is wrong. And that's why I think you mentioned perform performance based yeah, regulation. A lot of the things we talked about today circle yeah. back to PBR. Yeah, because that because in that context, those investors can make money. Right. Exactly. And the utilities can can do their job, but they're going to do it under not just building stuff for return on investment because that's always going to lead to building stuff we don't need because it's because that's yeah. but how about providing the better the better services that we want mm -hmm. as uh appropriate managers of our electricity system because the future is electric 
we, this economy will not work without electricity. I mean, you can see, you could just close your eyes and imagine every single putt-putt combustion vehicle on there plugging into the grid and the amount of electricity. I mean, if you look at the U.S. Department of Energy's Solar Future Study, that's a doubling of uh, electrons in the transmission system in the next 15 years. Double in the amount of electricity. So, you know, we have to get this right. You yeah. know, if mm -hmm. I'm a utility investor, if I put my that hat on and I'm like, huh, how could I make the most money the way to make the most money is no competition, regulators that will approve every project, capture the customers so that they don't have options for rooftop solar, don't have options for energy efficiency. There's no demand destruction in the system because the more we build, the more money we make, and like the more justification we have to build, the more you can build. And so you have to you have to push back against that, or else when you look at Michigan and Illinois and Minnesota and Iowa, all of which have historically and in recent years had more active planning, more consumer friendly policies, then they're gonna have better electricity rates. They're gonna attract more businesses. They're gonna have less household expense for energy. And I mean, it, so I think it's a real economic issue in my mind. You know, it's gone from at the MREA, it really started, the MREA's roots were really a response to the first Gulf War. And this kind of like whole idea okay. of how do we as local people get out of this endless war for oil and the response was well we need to talk about our energy use and here we are 32 years later mm -hmm. war between what's the big conversation in europe right now russian oil what's what nord, nord stream two nord yeah, stream one exactly yeah. what's the conversation what's the, in the united states not gas prices right it's still we're still in this kind of conversation. And as we move to electricity, that gives us the opportunity to decouple ourselves from that geopolitical nightmare that has been managing the world's petroleum uh, and keeping the seas safe. Um, not that we shouldn't still keep the seas safe. That's probably important. But, <laughs> um, but I think, you know, that, and that's where the MRA has come from. And now more and more, where we find ourselves as really fearful about being trapped in an electricity system that's too expensive to be competitive in a global or even national marketplace. That's that's what has that's what has me motivated is because like you said, the conversation has changed, the technology has improved, the costs have come down, consumer interest is off the charts. And so it's a real opportunity and I think having rules that support investors making money, that yeah. helps money flow into the system but making money in our service, not against us, right? The last thing I want is my utility to take my money that I pay for electricity and lobby against my interests at the Capitol and against my interests at the Public Service Commission. That is a system that's broken. Yeah, and we've been talking a lot about you know choice and options and flexibility and you know competition. And, and what you know, one of the things I think about when you say that is we've had conversations with some utilities that are a little more receptive about you know them thinking more of their service as as something where they should offer a portfolio of products however you want to construe that with respect to utility service that meet various folks needs in different ways and it's not just a one-size-fits-all like utility service has been for like a hundred years right and that can give that can provide customers choice without having to go down the road that a lot of people don't want to go down, which is when you say choice in the utility industry, usually people think like retail choice. Yeah. We can we can stay within the the lane of the sort of regulatory framework we right work we have right now, as long as we fix a lot of the things we're talking about right that, that we're talking about. We give customers the options. We don't allow the utilities to continually put the thumb mm -hmm. on the scale, um, and we don't allow you know sort of essentially discrimination against. Um, you know, customers, you know, taking control of, of, of how they meet their utility needs. Um, I know you got a lot of stuff going on, I, you know, looking out at what's going on at the, at the fair and just, you know, I know you're very plugged into, you know, policy issues and regulatory issues and, and customer uh, items are in, the, in Wisconsin and, and, and abroad and, and farther than that. You know, what are sort of the, the big items, you know, looking out over the next 12 months that you think that we're, we're going to be spending a lot of time on? Well, I think the third-party financing question um, is is kind of fundamental because it's you know it's it basically in my mind it's kind of like this canary in the coal mine because if the public service commission, if the legislature, if the court system, wherever this ends up, if they decide that somehow 
the utility has been given the authority to dictate how I finance something on my own house, that is a precedent. That's a, that's a state I don't want to live in. You know, that's not a place I want to be where some for-profit company has been given monopoly control over me and can reach through my electricity meter and dictate the, the, the type of things that I do on my own house. And so I think that one for me is, in as much as, you know, there are probably better um, programs that can bring more people into long-term energy bill reduction, I think pay as you save is a good one, a uh, good example of that. I think our focus on energy program you know, I need, think that budget needs to be tripled. I know the chair has called for doubling. The Demeavers administration has called for doubling. That one always saves everybody money. It's the only competition really we have in the marketplace. As much as, you know, I think that could be leveraged more. But I think this question about, you know, what do we live in? a Do we live in an open market here? Do we live in a free society? Like how much monopoly control are we willing to accept? I think is an interesting question because the technology innovations that we see out there has act, they're actually disassembled the idea of how much of a monopoly is really needed. Obviously, there's millions of rooftop solar systems that market's not monopolized anymore. Um, you don't consider yourself a public utility by virtue of those panels outside? Definitely not. Like, what is a public utility supposed to do? They're supposed to serve the electricity needs of all customers, right? right? Not just one customer, not just me. Um, so I think that issue is a really fundamental issue and we'll see what kind of like merit our regulatory process has and what merit our judicial process has to like really think about our, are we operating within the constitutional and like judicial limits by which we envisioned utility regulation a hundred years ago. Um, so I think that issue is going to be really interesting to watch. Um, I think the parallel generation dockets are interesting because one of the things that's been frustrating to me, like, so here we are at the MRU, we are at, in the light territory, you can net meter up to 20 kilowatts. So we're over 20 kilowatts, we got a 20 kilowatt carport, the whole roof's covered with solar. So the utility just pays us cents for our electricity. And so we produce more electricity than we use, but we pay a huge electricity bill because we're outside of net metering. Okay, that's all fine. Um, but we know it's more valuable than that. We know it's providing more service than wholesale power because it's at the point of load. It's going to all our neighbors first. It's satisfying our loads. That reduces the, the you know investor investments, all this stuff. So the parallel generation dockets, even though they're not really talking about meter connected systems, they are asking the utilities to be like, what value are these when mm -hmm. they're connected to the distribution system? And what the utilities have done in recent history has been like, your solar costs rate, rate payers money. But when we use our investor money to build the exact same solar, that's good for everybody. You know, like you can't have it both ways. Or when the, some utilities have programs where you can rent, rent your panels rent from them. Exactly. Right. They like that, but they don't like when a customer owns it. So like really defining what the values and having a process. And I don't know that the process that we're going through in Wisconsin is good. It doesn't seem to me to be sufficient to the scale of need. But I think that conversation is really important to have. Um, and then I think the other one is, you know, the other thing that we have here is like, like I was saying, we were the first, if the fr probably the first DC fast charger in the state. Well, we all, we have one utility meter. We pay them plenty of money, you know, um, the utilities helped us install that charger. They financially supported it because they see the electricity demand growth potential of taking all that container fuel and putting it on the grid, right? They right. want to sell more electrons. But it's all behind one meter and it's connected to our solar. So now they have legislation that they're supporting, you know. Think about the potential of satisfying all of that electric to vehicle demand all over the state with solar energy. Like if you could, as a gas station, put up a big solar canopy and change your gas station into an electron station, you know, and you're reducing your, you're selling a lot of electricity, but you're reducing your utility bill through solar energy and you're helping the distribution system and you, you have a smart management so you can time all this stuff works. Well, the utilities want to say, okay, it's gonna be legal to sell by the kilowatt hour. Right now they say, if you sell by the kilowatt hour, you're a public utility. So everybody right. sells by the minute or right. the second. It's still legal, you just do it differently. But now it's gonna be legal, sell by the kilowatt hour, but only a utility purchased electron can flow through that charger. Well, what happens when the sun shines here? We are out of compliance, is our charger illegal? We can't own our own solar on the same meter as this charger. So that's another one where 
we are a unique state in which the Public Service Commission has allowed the utilities to take ratepayer money and reach beyond the utility emitter and into what used to be only a competitive space and now be a monopolized space because they have their pilot programs where then they're now competing with within what used to be a competitive space. And now are we going to let them reach beyond our utility meter and dictate what we can connect if we have an electric vehicle charger? I mean, there. So for me, it's more it's more this real like what is. What are we, what rules are we trying to, are we really trying to create a regulatory environment that is a semblance of competition that protects ratepayers? And all of these little issues and their minutia that you guys are involved in, you know, it's a full contact sport too. Like this is, these are the things that I think are really interesting. Other states have already decided these issues. We're just trying to do it worse. <laughs> we want to do it better. We want to do it better. Um, we, we want, want policies to, to think about the consumers and optionality and not just think about profits. And that I'm glad you brought up performance-based regulation because I think we need a system where the incentives are in the in the proper place. I want right? the now utility we've got working the for us, not against we've us. We've got That's the incentives to yeah. build, 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 and we need an incentives to talk about all the demand side, energy efficiency, affordability. Well, let me answer a question you didn't ask also. You said 12 months, but and maybe this will be in 12 months, but here are some bigger issues that I think are really interesting. One, Dairyland Power, small modular nuclear reactor. That should be interesting. That, that will be interesting. That's gonna be interesting. And also, you know, there are three mines proposed in Wisconsin. And, uh, you know, in the context of a clean energy transition and like supply chains for all of the minerals needed for energy storage and you know we just saw the tariff exemption and defense production act for this stuff and right. you know like the infrastructure bill and all these things the question becomes do we just export the mining to the democratic republic of congo which is neither democratic or a republic or do we support some process in wisconsin or domestically by which we own these supply chains and can we do it in a way that is actually clean and beneficial to local communities. Because if you go right now and you look at some of the mines that are proposed, you know what their lead marketing is? Mining for the clean energy transition. So I think that there are some real interesting, complicated issues that are hard to solve on the horizon that are outside of the Public Service Commission, but are really important to talk about in this in this energy transition. Can we satisfy our electric, if we use 10 times more electricity per capita in the United States than the average for the rest of the world, which we do. We already do. We right. already do. Is there a way to satisfy that need without focusing on efficiency and demand reduction and better electricity use? And I think the answer is no. And if the utilities are in Wisconsin, if we don't have integrated resource planning in Minnesota, they have all resource procurement. So it's like, if you have a utility, if you're a utility and you want to build something, you got to build it with the most cost-effective resource. If it's gas, uh, peak or gas, or solar plus storage, or wind plus storage, or whatever it is, and in Wisconsin, we don't do that either. So we don't have competition. We don't have integrated resource planning. You know, the question is becomes like, yeah, I I would love to support a small modular nuclear reactor that does that's well built, that provides local tax revenue, that that is affordable, that's competitive, that saves ratepayer money, is that clean? But do I trust the the process by which that would be approved? I don't know. Then yeah. that's can we have nice things if we don't have a good process? I'm yeah. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I am I am somewhat glad that uh, Dairyland uh, Cooperative is taking on the SMR issue first because the wonk in me is like I've always been like okay, well, um, you know we need uh, we, we're looking for non-emitting, we're looking for um, carbon-free energy sources. We need something to help back up solar. Batteries are going to help, but there we need we need that next breakthrough in in the market. And so I'm just the wonky part of me is going to be following that, but I'm glad it's kind of happening. In an air, I'm, I'm glad <laughs> it's, it's like, happening in a part of the, deal of the, with part of part of the state that we don't have to deal with. And then we can be like, oh, look, this is what happened or didn't happen. Um, yeah, that, that, that is really, you know, you, you hit on a couple of really big items and, and those are going to be, uh, you know, kind of key to watch. Um, I'm sure we could, I'm, I know we could talk for like hours. <laughs> we should uh, do a workshop next year at the fair and record there you it go. just Let's like do this. That. Yeah. We, 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 we could definitely do that. Um, on a lighter note, you know, so let's 
thirty second MREA fair. I'm gonna I'm gonna say have you have you put on your prognostication hat. What's gonna be your guess as to the the big new theme item for the fair next year? Huh. What it can be a wild ass guess. I don't care. What was the, <laughs> what was your what was this like? cost effective what was your maybe we'll make it your tagline there you go <laughs> cost effective for consumer optionality oh wait is next year election year is that is that where we're at I mean, it's late in the I day think, here at the i think fair. it's already here yeah i mean we're in election is before you 24 7 365 elect uh election when is cycle. it not an election year? yeah it feels like um yeah you know that's a good question Corey. um i think what the question that I was asked earlier today was like, what is MREA focusing on? And on the one side, on the training side and on the technology side, we're constantly, like, like I said, we're a first DC fast charger. We have this big energy storage desk. Uh, we always are doing it. We're not talking about it. We're doing it and people are tinkering with it and we're and we're seeing what the we're limits of this stuff. It. You're fi you know, you're you're training businesses and you're training electrical inspectors and you're like pushing that envelope and we're gonna keep doing that. But I think the other thing we're doing is we're really focusing on like how do we bring more people into our movement? How do we call people in? You know, this whole event is intense. So I'm mm -hmm. like we're a big dent organization. How do we call people in um, and so in the context of the, this political cycle, the real frustration for me has been, and it has to be for you, is that in as much as this is an absolutely fundamental economic issue, like a clean energy transition is an economic development program, a jobs program, a climate program, a peace program, it's all these programs, right? But we are distracted by this constant political culture war and like this like dumbing down of the political dialogue. So I feel like as we move into this election cycle and as we get closer to you know governor's election and presidential election and all that stuff, I think that it you know for me like on a personal level and what I've been telling everybody is like hey, if you don't like your neighbor because of how they voted in a national political election, then we're all losing. That is, that is not how we advance as a society. We are in this together as a community, we're in this together as a state. So I think that's where my mind is about theme. It's much more of like, how do we de-escalate and how do we make this happen with a broad stakeholder group? And I think, again, just to, just to, uh, Show my appreciation for you all. I think you do a very effective job at that. And so hopefully you'll be at the fair next year. We will. We're glad to be a part of the conversation on policy and glad that you are uh, you gave us the Midwest exper uh, uh, experience to hear uh, lessons that Wisconsin can learn, learn from some of the other states MREA works on. And, and of course, we're glad to be at the fair. Yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah, the time is great. So uh, like and subscribe if you've, if, you've, if you've liked this or any of the other shows. And um, maybe we'll, we'll it, it might have to be virtual because if you're working up here, I'm not driving an hour and a half just to set up some mics. But uh, we'll, we, we, we definitely should continue this conversation, Nick. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll let you get back to the fair. But right. thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.